So at the beginning of this session, I would like to request our keynote speaker, Dr. Muhammad Saidul Islam, to present his keynote speech. Yeah, let me share. The... You can see my slide, right? Yes, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'uzu billahi minash shaitan ar rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Moderator, speakers, viewers, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my long gratitude to the World Muslim Heritage Research Center, United States, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my ideas about one of the uh, most crucial and critical topic of our time, which is Islamophobia. Uh, so uh, let me go directly to the topic. So. Um, so basically, um, what do you know that, uh, you know, according to the psychologist, uh, phobia or fear is the most powerful human emotion. And basically there are two kinds of fear. One is called rational fear, you know, for example, fear of a snake, fear of fire, because, you know, we know that fire burns people or burns anything. So there is a rationality behind it. But there is also another kind of fear, which is known as irrational fear. So that kind of fear becomes unbridled as you cannot see the real enemies. So it can change you all the time. Um, you know, the, it causes deep-seated mental anxiety, unrest, and depression. And the object is very vague, unknown, and sometimes manufactured. So in case of, um, so when phobia and anger becomes together, it becomes a kind of deadly combination. In case of Bangladesh, for example, we have the Chetona politics, and you will find uh, you know, a combination of both phobia and anger. Uh, Islamophobia is not just a simple thing. It's a very powerful machine and also industry at the same time. Currently in the US, it is a, it is a two, almost $2 billion industry. And the money is, think about that, these $2 billion is used to systematically create fear and anger against Muslim and Islam um, within and beyond the United States. So that's why the topic is very, very significant. So the question is, what is Islamophobia? Islamophobia is basically an extreme fear of and, and hostility towards Islam and the Muslims. And it can lead to a lot of things, hate speech. Uh, it can, for example, in social media, sometimes we see hate crimes and that include attack, killings, you know, shooting, vandalizing mosques and so on. It can also lead to social and political discrimination. When you talk about hate crime, for example, one of the great example is uh, the Charles, Chris Charles incident in New, New Zealand uh, on 15 March, 2019, that killed 51 Muslims. And you know that 40 people got injured. And then it also led to mass surveillance, imprisonment, you know, domestic as well as foreign um, policy change. So we can see that uh, Islamophobia has, you know, unprecedented impacts, starting from the inner self to family to society to international relationship. And also in the internationally, it can lead to war, it can lead to conflict, regime change, as well as genocide in the name of, you know, uh, what we call Islamophobia. So Islamophobia is not, um, normally, you know, it came to the political discourse after 19, uh, 9-11, but is, Western discourse actually had Islamophobia a long before, at least from the Middle Ages. Um, the first one was uh, support for the Crusades at the time. We can see that the negative stereotypes about Muslims actually helped to build popular support for the Crusades. Secondly, we also see the European colonial domination at the time. You know, they, they construct Muslims as something alien or bad or, you know, with negative connotations. And this is how they try to justify the colonial invasion around the Muslim world. Orientalism, American author uh, Edward Said actually popularized this term and he died in 2003. He used the term basically to describe the patterns of negativity and stereotyping um, the Muslim population within and beyond the United States. Lately, we can see the, you know, Ranime Trust, uh, the term Islamophobia was actually popularized in 1997. In its report, this is a British trust, uh, you know, it has a report in 1997 and that uh, actually deals with racism and ethnic prejudice. Just a genealogy of Islamophobia, actually from, from the very inception of Islam, we can see Islamophobia was there 
because the local people in Makkah, for example, they some of them were very much afraid of Islam. Uh, so, you know, within theology, there was always debate about Islam. But that debate came to the you know, academia with the writings of the clash of civilization by Huntington. And later on from academia to political discourse came with the uh, neoconservatives. And we, perhaps you know that in US, you know, neoconservatives is basically an offshoot of the Republican party. And they include, for example, George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, uh, Paul Olpovich, Elliot, uh, Elliot uh, Abrams, uh, Richard Perle, uh, Paul Bremer, Donald Rumsfeld, and so on. So these militant offshoots uh, within the Republican Party, you know, they had a kind of ideology to forcefully impose neoliberal principles around the world. And they are the one who are the architect of war, sanction, intimidation, diplomatic bribery, and all kinds of things that happen after 9-11. And after that, uh, we have, uh, we see that Islamophobia came from political discourse to policy apparatus. And one of the examples is definitely Homeland Security. Uh, Homeland Security was established on 25th November 2002, and it is uh, it is an organization or the government organization that has a budget of 52 billion dollars, and it has 240 thousand people employed in it. And later on, we also see that from political apparatus to international relationship. And war on terror is one of the great examples to understand the um, Islamophobia. And we know that war on terror, uh, it actually killed more than 4.5 million people across the world. I think there is a need to, see, to understand the, the difference between uh, uh, the terrorist attack by the Muslims. We cannot deny that there are some examples of terrorism by the Muslims and that killed about 5,000 people across the world. On the other hand, war on terror killed 4.5 million people across the world, mostly Muslims. And it cost about $8 trillion. Um, and 20 million people got homeless, you know, uh, five, at least five countries become totally rubble because of war. And from there, we can see that from uh, international relations to, relations to monolithic discourse, that is either, either you are either with us or with them. And in many countries, you know, this has been equated with their own politics. In Bangladesh, for example, it was colluded and equated with the Chetana politics, as I mentioned before, and it created a total reign of terror and justified, it actually justified the, the kleptocratic fascism uh, for the last 16 years in Bangladesh. India also, you can find uh, the daily violence on Muslims and that become normalized uh, in the name um, of you know, countering or containing the Muslim. And this is definitely one of the great examples of Islamophobia. So basically we can see the cultivation of Islamophobia in many countries across the world, both uh, Islamic and non-Islamic countries in America. It was done largely by Bush and Trump, India, Modi, France, Macron, Australia, John Howard, Germany, we have AFD party, Netherlands, we have liberal party. Uh, China, we know that they use this term basically to uh, treat the Uyghur people. In Bangladesh, as I mentioned, the current uh, Bangladesh Awami League regime also to some extent use uh, Islamophobia to justify its uh, operation on the Islamic parties. So the, uh, now let me talk about the construction of Muslims, you know, and all this in Islamophobia actually create some kind of fear and terror around Muslim and, the, and Islam itself. So what they constructed are basically diametrically opposed to what Islam and Muslims are all about. First of all, they create, they, you know, this is one of the notions that they created. Uh, Sharia means punishment. But we all know that Sharia, um, we all know that um, this is not the actual reality. You know, Sharia is not something uh, that is, um, you know, that, that talks about punishment. But what we know is that uh, this is, uh, you know, Sharia means actually the spring of water. And it, it has, the, it will, if we look at the Makassid of Sharia, we can see that um, there are, um, you know, there are a lot of things that are being protected by Sharia itself. So Sharia basically talks about uh, the, Anyway, okay, so Sharia um, is, is basically the protecting the Muslims, protecting the non-Muslims, and uh, it talks about uh, the, the tranquility, the peace and justice in the society. But, you know, uh, the fear and, you know, fear around Sharia is actually created around it. The second one is Islam means terror. This is also another thing, you know, it, it is, um, we know that Islam is peace, and this is something that is actually, um, 
um, you know, Islam is uh, Islam is a religion of peace, and we know that. But you know, um, in in the discourse of uh, Islamophobia, we know that Islam has been created as a kind of terror or the religion of terror. Muslim means you know being Taliban or uh, or Arab, but we know that you know only twenty percent Muslims are basically Arab and Taliban, and the bulk of the Muslims, about eighty percent of them, are not you know Arab and Muslims, Arab and Taliban. Islamic history means medieval atrocity, but if we look at the history of Islam, we know that Islamic history is is a history of the the the, the brightest beacon of human civilization. You know the the great potentials of human beings. You know, there was a great civilization at that time. In fact, at that time, the Europe was totally in slumber and they were, you know, covered with darkness. So these are the, some of the notions that are created by uh, Islamophobia. The question is how it is, how it actually started. Uh, we know that um, in uh, 2000, post-2021, uh, 2001, basically, uh, Northerner equated most fundamentalism with Islam. And this is basically a fundamentally response in itself because it portrays Islam uh, as a monolithic and alien religion and uh, ignores the variety of Islamic orders. It ignores the relationship between fundamentalism and neoliberal, neoliberal modernity. It ignores that other religious fundamentalism actually have equal capacity for violence. And we know that the media actually had a great role to play. So who gets represented at fundamentalism is usually one-sided. According to FBI, 94% of terrorism from 1980 to 2005 are not by Muslims. In, European, uh, in Europe, we find that in, in, in 1,000 terrorist attack in the last five years, only 2% by Muslim, 2% of the terrorist attacks were done by the Muslims. And you can also see very clearly the media representation. According to Guardian, Terrorist attack committed by Muslim extremists received 357% more US coverage, press coverage than those committed by non-Muslims. So we understand that, you know, um, media actually has a huge interest on this thing. Now let us see, you know, what is going on in the last uh, 150 years, uh, you know, just to check the facts, you know, who are the real perpetrators of terror and horror. Out of 160 million dead, more than 135 million people have been killed in or by China, US, UK, France, and Russia. The killing by the Muslim countries form a very small percentage, despite the fact that the Muslims form about one fifth of the global population. So if we convert the figure into the community-wise breakdown, uh, we find that 90% of the violence has involved Christian, Buddhists, and the atheists. Let's be more specific. We know that the Hitler, he was not a Muslim. He killed five, 6 million Jews. Stalin killed 20 million people. Mao Zedong killed 15 million people. Mussolini killed 400,000 people. Ashoka in Kalinga battle, he killed 100,000 people. Bush killed more than 2 million people. And in this way, that the list goes on and on and on. We know that World War I, World War II, 20 million Aboriginals killed in Australia. You know, the bomb dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 180 million Africans become, you know, uh, slaves. They were made slaves and out of them, 88% actually got uh, killed or died. So all these things, the, all these crimes against humanity, and you know that the Muslims had very little or no contribution to all these things. The question is how it actually started and how, um, you know, how knowledge for regime according in you know, around uh, this, um, Islamophobia was created. Um, so we know that there is an efficient knowledge power regime has been created around Muslims and the process is threefold. The first one is problematization, creating knowledge in a very efficient way to construct truths about Muslims. Okay, for example, they are traditional, they are lacking, they are fundamentalist and all kinds of things. And they take a very cherry picking approach and they take one you know, tiny fraction of the examples and make it representative to the whole community. Secondly, institutionalization, powerful think tank, government office to make the knowledge official and credible. And finally, normalization of power. The effects of power are rationalized and go on uncontested. And people accept it without any kind of question or protest. And it became, and people become in a self-discipline and they behave, they behave accordingly. Later on, we also see the demonization of Islamic symbols. Islam and its symbols are constructed as a new adversary to capitalist expansion. 
Islamology and, and its symbols were therefore re received by the people as inimical to civilization and progress. We also see the constant equation of Osama bin Laden, you know, his beard, his turban with terrorism. And we can see that demonization of Islam and its symbols like jihad, hijab, etc., become a lucrative career for many. And we can see in different universities and different centers, there were the new departments, you know, uh, focusing on terrorism as well as security studies. All these constructions justify imperial invention and intervention. And we know that according to Arthur Escobar, capitalism needs this discursive construction for control, for power, for market expansion, as well as for containment. So what are the impacts and responses? The, the first you know, impact or response is internalization of Islamophobia. We can see that both Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they have taken Islamophobia, in, they have internalized as a, as a kind of you know, uh, truth. And then we also see the fear and anger um, expressed in different forms in, for example, drawing cartoons, burning the Quran, vandalizing mosques and so on. Uh, discipline subjectivity, you know, in case of USC, we see there is one study that shows that one out of five Muslims, um, you know, they hide their Muslim identity because of Islamophobia. Massive inferiority complex is permeating around the world, especially within the Muslim community. Uh, we also see sporadic resistance for Islamophobia, meaning that they want to propagate Isma Islamophobia further. And we can see this happening within Muslim community and beyond. And in many non, you know, Muslim countries, they also take Islamophobia as a kind of tool to woo the West, basically to equate themselves with the war on terror. And in other sense, we also see a sporty resistance against Islamophobia as well as mass political mobilization. Okay, the question is, I think the most important question, how we can counter Islamophobia? And here are four uh, fundamental ways we can think of. The first one is reinventing our greatest stance. Uh, as a Muslim community. Secondly, understanding educational challenges of the Ummah. Thirdly, finding conflicts and congruence within Muslim and other cultures. And finally, formulating an bro a broader agenda. Let me focus every one of them. So what we have to, the first thing we need to do is to reinvent our greatest strength. The first one that we have as Muslim community, we have the authentic revealed knowledge that no other community in the world actually has. Secondly, we also have the favor of the Supreme God because he's the one who delegated the responsibility of you know, propagating peace and justice around the world on the Muslim country, on the, on the Muslims basically. Um, but this is very conditional. And then we have the strong historical and civilizational heritages. For example, Islam is the fastest and the long lasting civilization around the world from 624 to 1920. 1924, uh, okay, so around uh, about 1300 years, and it's still the fastest growing religion in the whole world. Uh, we also had the globalization based on social justice, and currently we have globalization, uh, we call it the neoliberal globalization, and that is based on exploitation. The next one is economic structure based on equity. And we know that there was a time when people were just, you know, um, you know, wandering around the street to, you know, to give charity and there was no person to take the charity. And we have the written history of last 5,000 years, never in the human history, this kind of thing actually happened. So economic structure we had that was absolutely based on equity, not on inequality, which is very much pervasive in the current neoliberal globalization. Then we had the scientific revolution and there were two specific reasons behind that. One was to appreciate the science of Allah and the other one was to create social justice. But, but currently we have the scientific revolution and that is based on not you know, social justice or appreciate the science of Allah, but uh, profit maximization. So we had a balanced society. We had a huge heritage, the perfect combination of spiritualism and materialism. We had a society and culture and tradition and civilization that was environmentally sound, socially responsible, as well as culturally friendly. There was women rights, human rights, animal rights, and rights of the women. So this is basically the heritage and the, the great uh, civilization that we had. So we, there is a need to reinvent the, the greatest strength that we had um, within ourselves. The second thing is we need to understand the educational challenges of the whole ummah within the context of the neoliberal globalization today. First one is the orientation or identity. We know that according to Islamic culture, our, you know, our orientation is that we all are Khalifa 
akhirat centric life without disregarding this world. For other culture, they actually embrace something we call the secularism, this worldly orientation. Sometimes these, you know, um, you know, these differences are arbitrary, but I think it will be helping us to understand the, the dichotomy that we are facing in the world world today. The second one is relationship to this world. It is basically the amana. The world is a trust. Humans are a stewardship khalifa to maintain balance and justice in this world. But in other cultures, especially the Western culture, we can see it is basically enchantment according to Weber, utilitarianism, hedonism, and profit maximization. Solidarity and ethics, our culture is based on mechanical solidarity and ethical training guided by divine injunction, guided freedom, piety, honesty, etc. But in Western culture or other culture, we can see organic solidarity that is based on formal training, man-made, unbridled freedom of consumption. There is piety, but that is based on worldly appreciation. As far as social structure is concerned in Islamic civilization, it is basically the justice based on social justice, equity, and equality balance, order, and brotherhood, fraternity. But in case of other culture, you, know, you can see a lot of things like racism, colonization, Zionism, hedonism, uh, exploitation, sexism, classism, and all kinds of things. So there is a need to understand the educational challenges of the Ummah. The next one, we need to understand um, the, the conflicts and congruence that we are having with the neoliberal modernity. And I have identified at least five fundamental uh, differences as well as uh, congruences uh, at the same time. As far as the epistemology is concerned, we know that Quran and Sunnah uh, and human experience, this is basically our epistemology, but neoliberal modernity, human experience, science and technology divide of any uh, divine injunction. But still that is helpful. The secondly, freedom. Uh, our freedom is freedom from the shackle of other false God. We also enjoy guided freedom. And neoliberal modernity freedom from all other religion, enjoy unbridled freedom of consumption. Our tarbiyah or training is Khalifa ethical being and neoliberal modernity is tarbiyah, which is basically the consumer citizen or market culture. Political structure is Khalifa with democratic principle, rule of law, guided human choice, human rights, animal rights, etc. Political structure according to neoliberal modernity is democracy with manufacturing consent, rule of law, human rights as a showcase for private accumulation. Our social institutions are, you know, um, media, family, economy, et cetera, for just Tawhidic and universalistic society. There is money and power, but these are not the goal. This is just the means. On the other hand, in neoliberal modernity, we can see solely social institutions are basically for economic and political interest. Money and power determine everything, which is basically the ultimate goal. Finally, what I would like to see uh, um, focus on is the, you know, formulating the broader agenda to counter uh, Islamophobia. The first one is reclaiming space. You know, for example, the lost glory. We had the Islamic science. There is a need to reclaim that space, voice in society as well as positions of power. So sometimes the soft power can be hard reality, and there are around eleven different sectors that actually had soft power. For example, politics, media, lobbying group. Indians, academia, military, think tanks, diplomatic groups, civil service, human rights groups, as well as NGOs. The second one is reforming. Reforming our own culture if we find that there are problematic elements within our own culture. The third one is integrating good elements of other culture. Even within, within the Western culture, there are a lot of good elements, elements within that culture, and there is a need to integrate those, those culture within ourselves. Then isolating, we need to isolate ourselves from the destructive cultures, for example, drug, poverty, sexuality, and so on. Reinstalling, reinstalling family values, care for other elders, environmentalism, and et cetera. Deconstructing erroneous notion about Islam and Muslims, for example, terrorism. Reconstructing what we, what the West build, we need to find out loopholes and repair it with Islamic values. And the next one is restructuring, restructure our social structure, um, our human relationship, as well as our cultural patterns. Number nine is safeguarding. One Islamic culture is established, we need to safeguard with any cost. And finally, spreading, spread the goodness of Islam to the entire world. So these are the top 10 um, agenda that we need to inculcate. And this is how we can uh, solve the problem of Islamophobia. So we know that Islamophobia is not just a simple thing. It's very pervasive. It has a it has a huge impact starting from our inner self to our family, to our society, to politics, to the broader arena in international relationship. So that's why we need to have a broader agenda to counter Islamophobia. 
So let's pray to Allah so that we can, um, you know, work on this particular area and counter Islamophobia uh, based on our own ability. Thank you so much for listening to me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.